master's program is a one-year interdisciplinary uh, master's program at Georgetown. Our aim is to create effective advocates uh, for a better healthcare system, and our seminar series is, um, is geared towards that. Uh, we have a wonderful presenter today, and uh, Jen will introduce her. Oh, I'm sorry, Jen, one, one second. I did also wanted to say that our, the usual way that we do this is that if you have any questions or comments during the presentation, please put it in the chat. Everyone will be muted during the presentation. Afterward, we're unmuting everyone. Um, so be aware of that if you're um, having embarrassing conversations in the background or whatever, you may want to mute, mute yourself when we start that, um, when we start that conversation. Um, okay, turning it over to Jen. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Fred Berman. I am Jennifer Argueta Contreras, and I am having the pleasure today of introducing Cindy Pearson. She is the Executive Director for the National Women's Health Network. Originally from California, Cindy obtained her Bachelor's of Arts from University of California, San Diego. She started out as an abortion rights organizer for the Colorado NARAL at Women Care, and since then has spoken at multiple conferences and made appearances on very well-known print and on-air media outlets, such as the Washington Post, New York Times, LA Times, Good Morning America, CNN, and NPR, just to name a few. She has established herself as a well-known, well-respected, and most experienced woman health advocate. During her 20 plus years at the National Women's Health Network, she led efforts that protect women from risky drugs and devices, helped ensure that women have access to complete information about medical products and clinical trials, required the government to research conditions that affect women, increase access to reproductive health care services for women, and protect women from coercion and abuse. Cindy has fought high profile battles in her career that have led her to testify before Congress, National Institutes of Health, and the Food and Drug Administration. The National Women's Health Network does not accept financial support from pharmaceutical companies, medical device manufacturers, insurance companies, and the tobacco industry. Cindy's favorite quarantine pastime has been binge watching TV shows with strong female lead characters and is also a non-traditional baseball fan. After actively disliking the game for the first four years of her life, she has become very dedicated. In October 2019, she took five flights in the spin of 36 hours to live up to work, personal mm -hmm. commitments, and still make it back in time to DC to use her tickets to game five of the World Series. Go Nats. <laughs> All right, I'm passing Thank it you, to Jen. Jen. Now. Yeah, go Nats, except this is the season of which we will never speak. We'll just remember 2019. Um, so thanks to all of you for coming today. Um, I've seen some people uh, being admitted through the waiting room who I'm just like proud to be speaking um, with them in, in the um, virtual audience. And, and I'm really looking forward to, to talking with all of you um, when it opens up to the full discussion. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is the promise and perils of female sexual desire disorder. So what's the promise? I'll just give you the recap, you know, give you the, the quick summary and then go at length. The, the promise is better sex. But what's the peril of female sexual desire disorder? It's guilt, shame, wasted money, and lasting complications from uh, medicines approved by the FDA to treat this disorder. So, I want to say right off that I'm speaking on behalf of the National Women's Health Network. I got introduced as a person, you know, my accomplishments, my crazy baseball fandom, but I'm speaking, uh, sharing with you today an analysis that a group of people, all of whom have worked at the network over many years, have made together and in discussion with people who are on this call. So I want to acknowledge Amy Alana, Kate Ryan, Coco Jervis, Christina Shirell, Sarah Christofferson, and Maggie Guarini. I may be using I sometimes, uh, sometimes using we, um, but it's been a group process. Um, so how do we work on, by the next slide, um, female sexual desire disorder? How do we think about it from the National Women's Health Network perspective? You heard that we're independent of funding um, from insurance companies, uh, device manufacturers, drug companies. So we bring that to it, that we're, we don't have subtle or not so subtle fears of upsetting a funder when we look at any, anything to do with women's health. 
And we have a set of core beliefs and values. So they're up on the screen here, but I'll just talk about two right now that are salient to how we look at female sexual desire disorder. And one is a core belief that all people, including cisgendered women and trans folks, have the right to sexual pleasure on their own terms. Now for cisgendered women in nearly all societies, the right to sexual pleasure on our own terms means that we have to challenge a power structure, most especially patriarchal norms and institutions and religions. Our second core belief is that women's medical care plays second fiddle to men's. Not fully, not always, not as bad as it used to, but still. And this affects um, uh, research. There's less money um, for conditions that affect women disproportionately or solely. There are fewer women in clinical trials of conditions that affect both men and women still to this day, and no requirement, no explicit requirement from the FDA that women be included in proportion to their um, to to how to, to the affected, the people affected by the condition. Um, and there are fewer women in positions of power and influence in the field, in the biomedical enterprise. So as a result, and, and sort of it's, those things are symptoms and, and causes, women's conditions affecting women are not always fully explored or explored with the right lens. So an example that's pertinent right now is um, endometriosis, which is a hormonal and immune system disorder. It's characterized by several symptoms, one being painful intercourse. The fact of that, the fact of pain with intercourse, tr um, in these systems that disadvantaged women in their search for sexual pleasure was thought to be a psychological problem. And for many years, the medical profession and the research um, enterprise did not look at, and, at endometriosis as anything other than a psychological problem. It's, it's far bigger than that. That's, that is, I would say, pretty much over, but it's an example. Another example that I think continues a little too much today is the misunderstanding of women's female anatomy and the beliefs that the clitoris is only the external nub of tissue, ignoring the erectile tissue that underlies the labia and surrounds the vagina. So there's my examples of that second core belief, how it plays out. Um, but if you put those two core beliefs together, what, what do we want? We want the system to be responsive to the needs of women, to recognize that we have the right to sexual pleasure on our own terms to the same extent that do men and as do trans folks. And we want the system to be responsive to our needs. So changing religion, changing the patriarchy is kind of a fight over here, but the biomedical profession and responding to our needs. So given that, why am I so critical of female sexual desire disorder as a medical condition when it's paying attention to females and to sex. Wouldn't that belief lead me to be happy that sexual pleasure for women is being taken seriously by the medical profession? No, it doesn't. And the reason why is at the network, our analysis is that Female sexual desire disorder was driven in large part by pharma, which looked only at a very narrow group of women, cisgendered, heterosexual, monogamous. The, 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 defin the creation of FSDD as a definition um, has resulted in uh, the development of unsafe and in largely ineffective drugs. The creation of SS FSDD has led to an exaggeration of what may be the true experience of some women who lack desire that they used to feel spontaneous desire and are concerned by it. Um, that, that's been exaggerated. 
to build an audience and to build sales. And the creation of FSDD has obscured what we do know about female desire. So I would say that overall, the creation of FSDD as a diagnosis has made it less likely, not more, that women with sexual problems can find a solution. So I'm gonna spend some time covering the history of the creation and promotion of female sexual desire disorder, in part to really expand on why, despite that core belief of ours that women's um, conditions play second fiddle to men in the biomedical enterprise, that this creation of and, and, and attention to something about sex for women is problematic. So the, the, to go to the next slide, the history of female sexual desire disorder, FSDD, starts with the creation of erectile dysfunction, a medical disorder for men. Now, this is a medical condition that existed before the term uh, erectile dysfunction existed. It was called impotence, um, and it, that was a medical term to describe the inability of a man um, to achieve an erection. And yet, it was a medical term, it could be written in a chart, and it's another term, right? It's a term that gets used in common parlance, common conversation. It means the inability to be a, effective in an action. It means helplessness. And having a medical condition associated with a word that also has this heavy, uncomfortable feeling wasn't going to make it as easy as, as it could be to talk about the condition and to um, propose a treatment for the condition. So in 1992, through this National Institutes of Health Consensus Development Conference, the term erectile dysfunction was proposed, accepted in the consensus conference, and popularized. It's now the term a, a physician wouldn't necessarily write impotence. As a, as a diagnosis in a chart today, um, 30 years later. Um, and, you know, there were medications being, dis being tested, you know, being, there, were, there were medical solutions being looked for for the problem of the inability to achieve an erection. So the next slide is the little blue pill, Viagra. That was the first um, medication approved by the FDA for erectile dysfunction. It was in 1998. Insurance cover coverage followed quickly, um, uh, which, you know, back to that, <laughs> back to our values, it was very telling to us that insurers covered Viagra very quickly while at the same time declining to cover any prescribed contraceptives for women. That changed, but at the time, insurance coverage meant that it was affordable. And it was very popular. You know, it was marketed heavily at the beginning, and that may have played a role in the initial popularity, but it worked. It worked enough for enough people who used it that they became, you know, repeat users. And here we are over 20 years later, and that class of medicines is still very, um, very, uh, very big seller, very commonly prescribed, very widely used. So there we go. We've got some happy users back in 1998, and we've got happy executives at the company and, and chemists at the company that brought this first erectile dysfunction um, drug to market. And we've got a broader industry saying, hmm, well, this is a new class of drugs. It's a success as a business. It, you know, it, it serves a purpose, serves a human good, but it's also a success as a business um, proposition. So hmm, could we double our success? Could we do it for women? However, there wasn't the, <laughs> I was about to make a joke, there wasn't the, 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 <laughs> the easiest, there wasn't a hard and fast way to define what, um, what the equivalent of erectile dysfunction was for women. And I'm making a joke about erections, but you, to get FDA approval, 
you have to have a patentable product, first of all, but you have to have something that has a definition that can be tested against the condition, you know, is, is the condition prevented? Is the, is the, um, you know, is the, um, is the, you know, the, the cancer tumor shrunk? Um, so, and with erections, there you go, pretty easy. But what is it in women that can, can be defined in a way that can be tested, a drug can be tested and its effectiveness against? And here's where FSDD was born. So if you go to the next slide, I'm showing you the definition that was created at a closed door meeting funded by pharma, attended by 50-50 pharma. Well, the first meeting was 50-50 pharma and clinicians that work with pharma. And then the second meeting was 19 hand-picked clinicians, 18 of whom had financial relationships with the companies, with pharma. Um, and this, this um, description came out, this agreement, this consensus development conference. And you see those words, consensus development conference, but do you see NIH? No. And even, not even every NIH consensus conference has managed to, or guideline writing process has managed to come off without um, uh, too many, without problematic conflicts of interest. But this one had no, no claim at all to being free of conflict of interest. And it's, you know, it's international, yeah, but, it, but it's, um, it's influenced by the, by the funders. So here we have a definition. It becomes accepted because there probably is some connection to reality. There, I've, I've definitely talked to women who say they used to feel desire, spontaneous desire, and nothing else changed. The relationship didn't change, their personal health didn't change, their family stressors didn't change, but they just don't feel that same kind of spontaneous desire anymore. So there, there, there's probably a grain of truth or a kernel of truth or some amount of reality in this. But the, the way, the, what happened next didn't go in a direction that led to, to led in a good place. So um, one thing that happened around the same time in 1999 was an immediate um, misrepresentation of how many women had female sexual disorders. So that's broader than um, female, this, this language is hypoactive sexual desire disorder. I'm using the term female sexual desire disorder. FSD, female sexual disorder, is a broader term. In 1999, an article was published in JAMA claiming to have found that 43% of American women had female sexual disorder. And that was one of the crummiest, most often repeated statistics um, that I can think of. It, this, this is a survey of 1,500 women. They were asked if they had experienced one of any seven possible sexual problems um, uh, over the last few months. And if they answered yes to anything, they were counted as having, a, uh, having female sexual disorder. And, you know, difficulties with lubrication. <laughs> okay, that happens. Um, Anxiety about performance, that happens, and lack of desire. Well, that happens too, happens for a lot of reasons. You know, worry about a, a life stressor, um, new child in the family, um, relationship problems. You know, none of that was sorted out, but there, that 43%, 43% of women, this is a big problem. We need a medical solution. It's a big problem. It's a big unaddressed problem. That was the messaging that started to come out as early as year 2000, 20 years ago. So we've got this approved, successful, popular drug for men. Now we've got a definition for women that can a study can be designed and a drug test. And that's what the companies go off and do. And to give Pfizer credit, they had invented um, uh, Viagra. They did actual good studies. They did 
large phase three randomized placebo controlled studies of Viagra in women, it was a flop. It actually did uh, change the erectile tissue, did make erectile tissue more erectile, did make the um, erectile tissue stay erect longer, <laughs> but that didn't change, didn't do anything for this definition that's still up on the screen. Didn't, didn't change women's experience of desire. So it was a flop and Pfizer gave up, that's 2004. Around the same time, Procter & Gamble tested testosterone. You know, it's a hormone, we know hormones influence uh, sexuality, so let's give it a try. Uh, it was tested as a patch compared to a placebo patch, kind of sort of a little teeny bit effective, like, less than one more sexually satisfying event per month but you could measure it because you know the study was big enough so you could measure that difference and it, at any rate they came had a fda um advisory committee meeting you know at went didn't give up immediately the way pfizer did when it just flopped like okay well we found measurable effectiveness um went to the fda advisory committee and the advisory committee was not wildly impressed by this kind of lousy effectiveness but also pointed out the testosterone for women is potentially dangerous and women needed to know a lot more about what those dangers might be before FDA could approve it. So at that point, Procter & Gamble gave up. They didn't want to go down the route that, um, that Wyeth Theorist had been funded to go down with National Institutes of Health and with, through the Women's Health Initiative. So testosterone's off. But meanwhile, and those drugs both were sort of supported by theories. So, you know, there was the theory of hormones are involved in sexual desire and, and um, you know, testosterone, they backed off. There was the theory that erectile tissue is the thing for men, is it's the thing for women? No. So now we get to a drug that seems like maybe it's having some effect on this measurement, I'm still looking at the same slide, on this definition can be tested against this definition, but it's a brain chemical drug. And so in the 2000s, you start to see arguments or theories or um, you know, uh, biological pathways described that a brain, that lack of desire is, is a biological problem caused by an imbalance in brain chemicals. And so the drug that this that sparked this theory is phlebanserin. Um, first, you know, developed um, in in a in a um, a pathway of testing drugs for mental health conditions, um, but seems to maybe maybe affect desire. So it moves over. Now it's in the in the FSDD drug development pathway, and um, it's measured by. Um, not the how many times did you have sex, like the testosterone patch. It's measured by um, how often did you feel desire? And the, the volunteers for the trial kept a little diary every day. And come to the end of the trial, no difference. So it was a flop. That's about 2010. FDA, it um, did have a public meeting and, you know, the drug didn't work. And, and the company tried to say, well, that, that, that everyday diary, most people didn't keep the diary. We, we did have a real effect, but you can't see it because oh, so many missing diary entries. Um, but the FDA is like, nah, no. So company goes back, tries again, comes back in 2013, nah, no, FDA says no. But in this time, instead of just giving up and shelving the drug, like Pfizer did with Viagra for Women, this company just sold it off. And I always mangle their name. It's a German company, Boringer Ingraham. They sold it to a startup company that was created just to buy the rights to phlebanserin. And um, the company called Sprout kind of talked it over with FDA and said, we're willing to fund new studies, but let us change the diary situation. We'll still measure desire because that's, that's the disease we're treating, the condition we're treating. But how about if we just have that diary once a month? Now, I don't know who was in the room when they made that deal, but it's like the thought that, and, and some of the, you know, the proponents, the people who are in the profession treating, uh, treating um, 
treating women with, um, uh, well, go to the next slide. I'll show you the profession. This is their professional society um, of the, the physicians who, um, physicians and nurse practitioners who are um, real proponents of, of um, biological um, underpinnings of lack of desire and, and um, the possible for medica medication treatment of them. So um, the, the, um, th those people believe that asking, asking someone to write down in a diary once every 28 days, how'd you feel last month? Did you have a desire? A lot? Some? Not so much? Anyway, the FDA agreed to that as the outcome. So by 2015, the, the new company, Sprout, um, you know, companies are allowed to say what, uh, what they want about their drug pre-approval to in small meetings if they have um, uh, evidence mm -hmm. to back it up. But the FDA is not allowed to say anything that they've been told by the company. So we knew that this company was going around and saying, we did it right, and now we've finally been able to prove that our drug really does increase desire. But what they knew and what the FDA knew, but us in the outside world didn't know, is there were some pretty serious safety concerns, safety signals that had shown up in the trial. Um, specifically, what, what we didn't know but came out later in the hearing is that um, there was sudden loss of consciousness and dangerously low blood pressure, um, and that there had been twice as many, although not many, but twice as many accidents um, in, the, in the people getting the actual drug as compared to people getting the placebo. Now, twice as many was something like one half percent to one percent. That's not a lot, but it's still a pretty, you know, the safety signal is like, ooh, you know, if you, if you know there's dangerous, um, if, if you know it can cause low blood pressure and you see these accidents, um, the, unbeknownst to us, the company was asking, the, um, the FDA was asking the company to look more closely at alcohol use. And because the, the entry questionnaire filled out by people when they volunteered for the study had asked, do you drink, how often? And there were more drinkers in the, um, it, more people who said that, that they did drink alcohol in those few who had the accidents. Um, in, the, um, in, the, in, in the intervention arm. So it seemed like maybe, maybe something was going on. And, and behind the scenes, the FDA had asked the company to do a very standard, straightforward, 25 person in the clinic test of you either take a pill and a drink or you take a pill and a placebo, you know, fake drink, <laughs> or you take, uh, a fake drink and a fake pill, or you take a, a, a fake drink and a real pill. And, you know, you divvy it all up, the people, you watch them, you see, you know, how's their blood pressure, is anybody dizzy, what happens? So they were, the FDA was asking for that study. And this is all behind the scenes. And the FDA is not giving the company good signals about we're going to say yes. So the company asks for an advisory committee meeting and the company starts a fake grassroots campaign. And if you go to the next slide, so the company knew they were about to lose um, and or thought, feared they were about to lose. And it, you know, they, they had this little bit of effectiveness, little, little, little bit of effectiveness, you know, uh, on the desire scale, the once a month desire scale from one to five or one to six, it was about a one in 10% of the people who took the drug, but they were able to measure it. So they had this little bit of effectiveness, but these safety questions. And <laughs> unbeknownst to us, they did do that alcohol study in men, 23 of the 25 people were men. And people fell out, people faded, people had low blood pressure that didn't come back. One person had to be taken to a hospital. No one was hurt, everyone recovered, but holy cow, that's some bad results. And it's in men. <laughs> so it's not looking good for this company to get approved. So they start this campaign 
and damn, was it a smart campaign. They claimed that the FDA was biased against women. Not that they had a bad drug, but the FDA is biased against women. It built on second wave feminism. It built, it had a health feminist critique. The FDA, the FDA doesn't trust women to make good decisions about their drugs. They approve Viagra, Viagra has risks. At this time, we don't know what the risks are. They're saying, oh, it's just you're drowsy, you're sleepy. Uh, we don't know, people are you know, having their blood pressure crash and not come back or needing to go to the hospital. Um, but this campaign was called Even the Score. <laughs> and a, a misleading number, there are not 26, there's zero drug, so it's 26 to zero, that was the claim, misleading numbers. Um, but the, the, the kernel of truth, not only the positioning, the, the appropriation of our language of feminism and health feminism specifically, um, but the, the fact that the FDA had made biased decisions against women on reproductive health drugs when forced to by conservative administrations that were against reproductive freedom weighed heavily in people's minds. So this campaign wasn't a drug company campaign. It was a PR campaign funded by a drug company that presented itself publicly as a coalition effort. And the coalition was some professional societies, some women's feminist organizations. Some of those organizations were directly funded by the company or the PR firm to involve, uh, to engage in the campaign, but not all, not all. Because it, the message fit, the message made sense. It played to real demands of the women's health movement, of feminists, of health feminists. And it, it played on the, pri the, the, the prior reality and different talk side issue, the current reality with the FDA's restrictions on the abortion pill, that sometimes pressure from above, that, that the FDA had acted badly on, on women's reproductive health issues, and then they just stopped there. So their campaign won, they won. If you go to the next slide, 2015, June of 2015, the FDA approved phlebanserin, the drug that has people falling out, low blood pressure, Alcohol makes it a bunch worse, not very effective, but, you know, teensy tiny measurable effectiveness. Um, and boy, did, you know, if this had been a good product, it would have taken off like crazy because they got more free publicity than I've seen in I don't know when. A little pink pill. Men have a little blue pill, women have a little pink pill. Oh man, Whoo 2015, you couldn't really turn around without seeing some free. Um, publicity about this drug, but it didn't take off because it's not that effective. Um, and the alcohol, the FDA did put um, uh, a contraindication, of, of a black box warning of don't take, don't drink at all if you're taking this because the drug has to be taken every night. Um, take it at night so you don't get sleepy because the drug can affect sleepy and blood pressure all on its own, but don't drink at all when you're with it. So that was the problem for it. Also the fact that the startup company um, actually had no salespeople and they needed to make a marketing deal, you know, a built literally a billion dollar marketing deal 48 hours after they got FDA approval to a company that had salespeople. Um, uh, but, you know, once the FDA approves the first new drug in a class, it's rare for any subsequent drug to be better. They don't have to be. The bar is low. Now, better, you know, better, more effective can win you more customers. So yeah, sometimes drugs do come in that are in a class that are more effective. Sometimes drugs come in that are more convenient. And so the next drug that the FDA approved, if you go to the next slide, was it's more convenient in the sense that it's as needed. So Addy has to be taken every night, every day, every day, every day, every day, taking those pills, whether or not you're going to have sex. By Lisi, in contrast, bremelinotide is only used as needed. Now, downside, it's a little auto injector, but if that doesn't bother you, it doesn't bother you, you know? So they probably have something, you know, in effectiveness or convenience over Addy, maybe, arguably. However, their effectiveness, holy cow, you know, if Addy moved people up one point 
on a scale of one to five and how often do you feel desire you know last month this drug moved people up about a third of a point on a five point scale and the complications from it don't have the immediate risk of you know uh, getting in a car accident or doing something you know having having been injured um, um, because you had a sudden loss of, of consciousness. Um, the, the one that we know most about that became clear in the clinical trial is because this drug works through the melatonin pathway, in, in about 1% of the time, um, women who took the drug had darkening of skin in areas where it's darker already. So gums, nipples, um, caused by the drug didn't happen to women in the placebo. And in about half of those women, so half percent, um, it doesn't go away. So that's a drag, um, but it's known. So it can be included in the consent. And, you know, we were all about, you know, people make their own choices. As long as you have enough information, you know, you can be trusted and should be trusted to make a good choice on your own. Um, so here we are two approved drugs for FSD. The story that I've told you about the history of how it was created behind closed doors, it was created to have something that could be measured and tested against in a study. Um, so it was created with a, with a, um, a, a round, you know, not looking at what really happens, like a man's failure to achieve erection, which really happens, but looking at you know, the whole large and various way in which women may feel dissatisfied with sex and want better sex and picking out a thing that can be measured and tested against. So that's how we started. We got here. This um, by Lisi was approved in, in June of 2019. So now there's two drugs on the market. So are women having better sex? Well, if so, it's not very many of them. So I don't have up to the minute um, sales data, and I don't know that they're even out there for bremelinotide yet, but I do know that the bremelinotide um, sponsor that went through all the time-consuming, expensive process of getting FDA approval gave up the drug um, less than a year after FDA approval and gave it back to the original um, company, the company that did the original research on it. So now the drug is was a, sponsored by M AMAG when it was approved and now it is um, sponsored by Palatin. Um, so it's not doing that well. Um, and Addy had $10 million in sales in 2017 versus Viagra, which is in that class of drugs, which has been more than a billion dollars a year for over 20 years. Um, the both companies are now using the online prescribing strategy, and maybe that's going to, um, you know, increase sales. And 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 you know, the, the really kind of the proof is in the pudding. Um, you know, marketing might have encouraged men to try Viagra in the first place, but they wouldn't have come back for the refill if they hadn't found some success and and you know pleased with what they found. So it looks like. To the extent that any women are having better sex, because now we have drugs for FSDD, it's not many. But what else have we got? What, what, you know, the fact that we we not only have a definition, which we've had for 20 years, but now we have drugs. We have two drugs and have had for have had one drug for five years and now two. Where are we now? And that's the next slide. Well, I would argue that where we are now is problematic marketing and specifically um, the use of disease awareness campaigns to which um, do more harm than good. So if you go on to the next slide, um, what we see here is one of these campaigns. There's no named drug uh, associated with it. This was a website created by um, uh, um, Sprout, um, the, the sponsor of Addy, but it's unbranded, meaning the drug is not named, no drug is named, and it's positioned as to the average person, to the average woman, you have a right to desire. Hmm, back to the network's core belief that we all have a right to sexual pleasure. You have a right to desire. And then there's this 
you know, statement that 15 million women suffer from hypoactive um, sexual desire disorder. That's false. That's a, a, again another problematic study. Um, but it's it's this messaging that's saying this is this is something you should have, and many of you are missing it. You know, kind of a messaging that is designed to create doubt of like, oh, mm, am I not? what I should be. So next slide is another um, example. This one from a campaign that AMAG did, um, and I don't know if it's still up right now, um, uh, uh, but it's called Unblush. So again, that empowerment language of don't blush, don't be embarrassed. This is a medical thing. It's your, you know, just, you know, go for it, address it, and go on to the next slide. And, you know, this, this little graphic that they, they have on the side of, you know, it's it, the, the messaging, the positioning is pretty clear that you need to not be frightened of sex or of your own problems with sex and go, you know, go talk to someone about this medical condition you have. And the previous slide um, had was the end result of a very expansive checklist of do you have these symptoms? So these are all, you know, the kind of marketing that is designed to make you feel on, um, you know, uh, inadequate, on uh, not as good as you should be, um, deficient in some way and designed to drive you to a doctor and to drive you to ask about a prescription. Um, and so, you know, at the network, we have an alternative vision. We would like there to be a lot more messaging about sex, a lot more information about sex, um, and a lot more um, truly empowering images and messaging. So if you go to the next slide, and I'm going to call out someone who's super important in this, um, Dr. Lenore Tiefer, I saw come into the, um, uh, admitted into the, to the, um, the seminar at the beginning, and she, with just a wonderfully di diverse enthusiastic, creative, committed group of people, including the network, um, over 15 years led a campaign called a, a New View Campaign, that's the actual name, but its heart was New View um, of Women's Sexual Problems. And that is, um, that is, you know, really kind of what it should sweep the nation, you know, NIH should read this stuff, uh, you know, um, it, it's, it's, the, it's the way in which we see a positive way forward um, towards women's, both the, the acknowledgement that women and, um, and trans folks have the right to sexual pleasure on our own terms, and that, um, that our, 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 our medical needs should be taken seriously. So, What's wonderful about the New View campaign is it's um, information grounded in our own reality. So some of the questions that were explored in depth were what's normal? What do we even know about what's normal? How often does desire kind of vanish? Spontaneous desire that used to be there and there's no explanation. How often does it really happen? And does it come back on its own? We don't know that. And then teasing out the, the lack of spontaneous desire, which does happen sometimes, but what about responsive desire? And if responsive desire is still there, is lack or lessening of spontaneous desire truly distressing to very many people. Other parts of the New View campaign that were, you know, really wonderful and that we hope, um, you know, the, that the way forward is, is, uh, is, you know, really intentional about is its inclusivity. So gay, straight, bi, you know, how, what kind of sex, <laughs> who, who are you drawn to sexually? Does that have any, you know, difference in how you, how often or how you, how you, um, how you experience 
difficulties with sex or, or, or problems that, that need, need attention. And then being inclusive of um, trans folks that, you know, the, the sole narrow focus on cisgendered women um, needs to change as well. So hearkening back to where I started, FSDD, peril and promise, it doesn't meet our needs. There's way more peril than promise. So in closing, going to the next slide, I'm just going to um, refer to this, you know, where you can get more information from our website um, and uh, how you could follow us. Um, and I'm really excited about the, um, the discussion. And so I'll just rest on the final slide, which is inspiring photos of National Women's Health Network um, activists in action, mostly outdoors. We're very active indoors too, back when pre-COVID, when you could go indoors to talk to directly to FDA and NIH. Um, but I just, um, if it's okay with the organizers, leave that slide up while we do the chat. Um, and the discussion, which I'm, I'm really looking forward to. But I, I also, before we pivot to that, and I forget, I want to say thank you to the HAPPY program, um, Dr. Fuberman, and, and um, everyone in the program for inviting me and um, being, um, having a chance to have this conversation with you today. Thank you so much, Cindy. That was wonderful. Dr. Fuberman, you're muted. Oh, sorry, I hit it twice. So sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much, Cindy. That was wonderful. Um, <laughs> uh, we're unmuting everyone, which is a good thing since uh, <laughs> they, people can tell me that I'm muted. <laughs> um, and, uh, and there are a couple questions in chat that um, I, I just want to address first. Um, and after that, people can either put questions in chat or just um, call things out. So uh, one of the happy students, um, Chikaiza, um, Cindy, has asked, what are ways that women's health groups or health groups in general that focus on marginalized groups can avoid being co-opted in astroturfed healthcare movements? Should the groups avoid pharma in general? And uh, it's got a, a, a quote from class readings by Dr. Uh, Torold Solman, those who collaborate should realize, frankly, that under present conditions, they are collaborating not so much in determining the scientific value, but rather in establishing the commercial value of the article. Yeah, I wish all the, you know, this was a, this was a tricky one, the story I told of, you know, feminist groups being co-opted because there was a grain of truth um, to the, the, uh, the, the calling out of the FDA. But I think the um, question is more about uh, when groups who are um, underrepresented in, in clinical trials, in research, have disparate um, outcomes in, in conditions that are, you know, uh, experienced across the population, but marginalized groups having disparate outcomes or it, uh, having experiencing conditions that aren't experienced, um, more widely and will collaboration with a company um, that's intending to bring something to market to address that, um, will it be, um, how can you do that without being co-opted? Is there a way to do that without being co-opted? Can, can you collaborate at all without being co-opted? And um, you know, the network took the, the, the straight line of no, that we can't. Um, we came about in the 80s, um, uh, when it was a little easier than it is now to build financial support for an independent consumer group or an independent health group. Um, and we have, you know, we treasure our allies that, um, that have also been able to establish that kind of um, just hard and fast, no, never collaborate, never take money. Breast Cancer Action, National Center for Health Research, Med Shadow, um, I saw Suzanne come on also, um, DES Action, uh, Our Bodies Ourselves. Um, I, I know very few patient 
groups, groups who have organized around a condition that have been able to sustain a pharma-free um, position. And the only groups that I have personal knowledge of who I've seen do an okay job of drawing a fence were groups that said, you know, only 15% of our money, never more. Um, you, you, you were going to say what we believe at every FDA meeting. And if you walk away, that's on you, not on us. Um, you can't fund anything to do with our policy positions. You can't come to our meetings. You can't have access to our people. Um, and it's a tough position to take. Um, and you can only, a group can only take it if, if, in my experience, if they already have a pretty, um, you know, solid sort of, uh, you know, solid source of funding other than the drug companies or the... And there's still the possibility, of course, of getting corrupted over time. I mean, I would argue that if, you know, the money will, the money will dry up if you're not doing what industry wants. And Absolutely. Uh, yeah, there are very, very few. There is more than yeah. 7,000 um, health advocacy groups in the U.S. And uh, there are fewer than 20 of them that are not, do not take pharma money. Yeah, it's yeah. really important to support organizations like the National Women's Health Network. Um, um, also, so people put various resources in, in chat, um, including uh, Sharon Batts really great book, Health Advocacy yeah. Inc., um, which is about pharma funding of consumer advocacy uh, groups, specifically in breast cancer, um, but really applicable to everything. And uh, Leonor Kiefer, um, has put in the website of the New View campaign, which still has lots of really great resources um, on it. Um, so great. Um, let's see, did we? I think you had another chat question from a student, Adrian. Uh, ah, Esther. Uh, what do researchers and pharma companies need to continue doing research in this field? It seems that pharma-backed research efforts were pretty futile almost perpetuating the belief that women's bodies are so complex to the point that it's virtually impossible to remedy the disorders and discomforts we deal with. Is there a way that NWHN and other organizations push for better or more research uh -huh. uh, currently done? <laughs> yeah, so um, there are women who have come to feel lack of desire after taking another medicine for an important purpose. Um, uh, high blood pressure medicine, we've heard from many women, has made them, you know, uh, feel lack of desire and uh, they don't want to stop taking their high blood pressure medicines because in their case it feels you know it's, a, it's an important medicine similarly um, some of the mental health drugs that are useful for people also cause um, lack of desire now that definition was created to exclude that it was treating something lack of desire that um, had no explanation and um, and uh, wasn't changed by a new partner, so it wasn't changed by circumstances. So it's spontaneous um, loss of desire. I wish, and I said in many meetings, uh, you know, every chance I get, I wish drug companies would look at um, what can sort of mitigate this troubling side effect of drugs that are otherwise useful and important. Um, I'd be delighted to see that. However, <laughs> you know, some of the questions we want answered, are, you know, just don't fit, you know, companies that look for treatments for medical conditions first have to have a patentable product. That's why there's, you know, some kind of interventions that are known to work, but they can't be patented. And so no one's invested in getting FDA approval. And um, patentable product on a condition that can be measured and tested. So that's, you know, what else can be measured and tested in, in women? Well, um, uh, you know, uh, dry vagina. <laughs> There's lots of products for, um, for um, that, you know, even including some that have FDA approval to um, uh, 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 deal with a condition of um, painful vaginal intercourse. Um, which isn't always caused by, you know, uh, lack of lubrication, but uh, 
but in some cases that can be. Um, so women, some parts of women's sexual problems, I guess, can be kind of looked at as, you know, okay, this is a discrete problem. We can test something against it. We can show that it works. But most of what we want to know is really, I think, or a lot of what we want to know is really dependent on, um, you know, a more holistic and open-hearted and pro-sex approach to research, which, you know, if, 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 if research isn't in service of a patentable product that can be tested and FDA approved, industry has, is not an industry's business model to do it. So we go, as activists, we go to the NIH because that's our money. That's our dang money. We pay those taxes, it's our money. But ooh -wee, sex research at NIH, that is, a, ugh, you know, members of Congress have had their staff do Google searches for keywords you know, in, in NIH approved grants to pick out stuff about sex. And it's just not happening. It's just not in, happening. In 1997, when I was at NIH, I was asked to do um, a conference on vaginal immunology and physiology. And um, I, I, I organized this uh, conference and um, NIH would not announce the conference on its website because it had the word vaginal in it. <laughs> <laughs> Not so long ago. So Suzanne Robotti is asking, why do we have to depend on pharma to do research? Don't we have the NIH? Right. There you go, Suzanne. And yes, you know, for many, it is, that's our money. We have to keep targeting it. We have to keep saying, you know, be responsive. Who cares if it's hard? Do it. And in some cases, we get that. We do get that, you know. Um, preventing preterm labor, the, the, the original understanding of how that worked was oversimplified and wrong and NIH is trying to grapple with what is going on in preterm labor and how can we better understand it so that then we can maybe find um, an effective uh, intervention which we don't have. Um, so that's you know yes go to NIH go to NIH go to NIH but to get NIH to be able to talk about sex not just vaginal microbiology in preventing a disease that's transmitted by the vagina you know, the, the, that was a, a pre-study that would then later go on to hopefully lead to a microbicide, which we still don't have. Um, you know, something that uh, anybody who has um, receptive intercourse could use to protect themselves against um, the likelihood of uh, the transmiss transmission of HIV and other STIs. Um, we still don't have that, but that's what, you know, that's why you kind of have to have a conference about vaginal immunology. So, you know, it was like three steps removed from sex. Uh, so we kind of need a feminist revolution. And, you know, I'm living in fear of the, the, the upcoming election and what that means for women's health rights and, you know, everyone's health access and reproductive freedom and, you know, just surviving that is, you know, got us all in a state of terrible and anxiety. And yet what we need is so much more than just a good outcome in this one election. Really, and it, it's so important for the government to be funding things that pharma won't fund, as, as, uh, um, as Cindy has pointed out, you know, the ph pharma will only fund the things that are going to make it money. Um, and uh, while 30 years ago, uh, three quarters, about three quarters of research was funded by the government, now three quarters of research is funded by pharma. That is a problem we need to change. Oh, um, Dr. Myers. <laughs> um, so Cindy, our program here is, um, one of the things that we tell NRSS students is that it's kind of about the non-medical side of um, health, healthcare, perceptions of health, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I don't know, I mean, I, I think that when we talk about sexuality and desire, it's, if you ask me, it's okay, the biological part is, is very important, but I think for a lot of people, the non-medical side of it is, probably much more important. And um, how do we parse that out when we think about whether we need a drug or whether a drug is effective? What we learned, <laughs> Lenore Tiefer just chatted in clitoris education is what is needed. <laughs> I agree, yes. 
that the the idea that every child is introduced to their body in a sex positive sort of way and that the natural exploration that leads both boys and girls to find to figure out what's going on with their genitals is met with open openness and factual information that's a that's a great start towards what we need i and yes you know um you know uh the non-medical part of sexuality being maybe much more uh than the medical part but i will tell you from our experience of saying these pharma folks are trying to con create a condition you know they're trying to use drugs to fix women when really what a lot of straight women need is you know a more feminist man uh it just got us uh resentment from women who said, and who are we to disagree with them? My relationship is fine. My relationship is not the problem. There's something else going on. So, um, you know, while a vibrator or clitoral education might have actually helped some of those women, one thing I will say, and, and I, I know I'm giving a somewhat disorganized response, is that better coverage of, um, you know, parity in mental health and, um, and physical health coverage by insurance is a step, but you know how much actual competent uh, sexual therapy is available in the mental health side, it's not enough, clearly just not enough. So that's another issue. So I see lots of hands coming up, but I'm trusting that um, Dr. Fu Berman is still managing you know, which questions uh, and which order. 